All right, so uh, here we're going to start 16.4. Uh, this is basically a special case of the things that we will cover in 16.7 and 16.8. Uh, so it's basically just those two things, but special cases of them of just being in a plane rather than any three-dimensional or higher-dimensional versions that we'll talk about later. Actually, I think we'll just talk about three-dimensional ones. So anyway, first thing we have here is we have some sort of loop here. You can see it there in blue, and it's a square or rectangular loop. Uh, ultimately, it doesn't really matter the shape here, but the idea is that then we have these gray uh, lines you can see that are the uh, field, some sort of field that is cutting through uh, the blue hoop there. And what we're going to do is, if you look here, we're taking and dotting that force uh, along this along this side down here. We're going to dot it with the uh, part, with the component here, negative j, so the j direction, this vertical. Well, actually, I'm sorry, negative j direction, so this direction down here. And we're essentially going to take the components of it that are perpendicular. So if, if this is this is one of my field lines uh, for that uh, that vector field there, then I'm taking the perpendicular part. Down here on this side, where the perpendicular part of my field line is in the opposite direction of the negative j direction that I'm dotting it with, I'll end up with a negative uh, result there. And this is this would indicate then that um, the field is going into, into our hoop here. Up here, you can see if we had like our field line going like that, we'd take this positive, we'd take this component here that's perpendicular to the line there in the j direction. They'd be in the same direction, we'd end up with something positive. And then of course, on this side, we're doing it on the i direction and taking the perpendicular component and then the negative i direction. So anything entering into the hoop is going to be negative and anything exiting will be positive. Uh, we can sum this up with the idea of what is called the divergence or flux density uh, of a vector field where it's f equals mi plus nj at the point x, y. So here we're just calling it, this is a divergence in two dimensions. Uh, where this comes from is what I wrote here below. It's ultimately the del operator dotted with your force, or dotted with your field, I mean. Um, in this case, you can see in blue, I wrote in the, the third dimension, because this will apply out to a three-dimensional case, uh, even though up above it's only a two-dimensional case. If it's just a two-dimensional case, just take the i and j components and leave the k components as zero. But this is essentially the del operator, and you just simply dot it on to f and that will tell you your divergence. And what this is going to tell you is tell you how much uh, your fluid or gas or whatever is either expanding away, positive flux, expanding away from the point that you're looking at, or compressing into the point you're looking at. And so ultimately it would just be a scalar. It tells you how much the gas is expanding or compressing for a specific place that you're looking at. Uh, here are some examples you can see. Uh, you can see the here are the actual uh, vector functions for those fields there, and then to the right are the corresponding um, are the corresponding resultant fields. Uh, so you can look at this one like part A, and you can see very clearly this looks like it is expanding away from the center. And if you go through and actually do the divergence of this one, you will find that it is an expanding type gas. It does have a divergence expanding way. And so you can look here on the next page where I did that. Uh, it's CX in the I direction, CY in the J direction. I dot it with the del operator and ultimately go through and do it and you get 2C. So it's expanding at two times whatever the constant C would be uh, for that. And it's showing us that that is, does have a divergence. So what I want you to do is go ahead and try and make predictions about these, about B, C, and D, just by looking up the graphs, and then go through and just pretty simply just dot product these three here, right? I did this right here. Do these three right here, dot product them with the del operator, and see if you end up getting, uh, you know, what kind of a, a, a diversion you end up getting, if any. And so try that on those three and see if then that matches what you're you're thinking of as you look at those pictures. All right, uh, here's another example. Again, I wrote del up here at the top, the del operator, and we're just gonna take and dot product on there. So you can go back and just use this version right here if you wanna remember it, but this is the more general version that works in every case. So personally, I remember this and just know what the del operator is and just do it, uh, or you can memorize this, but of course, you're gonna have to go back to this version 
uh, when you get to the three-dimensional stuff for the most part, or you're going to be doing a lot more memorizing than you need to. So if you look here, all they did was start with that version, the, the, the partial m, partial x, partial n, par plus partial y, um, right there. But what I tried to kind of cram in here was here's the two-dimensional del, and then here's my actual function. And so when you dot them together, you get partial, partial x of the m part, which is, you know, that's this, this is m, the x squared minus y, and this is n, x, y minus y squared, and then you get partial, partial y of the n part. Uh, and so by doing that, you immediately end up with what we have right there. And so essentially, you're just skipping a step if you start with that other part. And then you can see, just go through, take the partial derivatives, combine them together, and here is your divergence. So you'd put in a point for x and y, and it would tell you what the divergence was at that location. Unlike our previous example, where it was 2c everywhere, it was totally independent of your location, the divergence was the same at every location, this divergence varies from point to point. Uh, here, we have another little example here. Let me clean that up a little bit, sorry. Uh, this time, very similar looking picture to the last one, but this time we're dotting it with the vectors that lie along the boundary instead of, instead of perpendicular, whereas in the last one we dotted this with negative j in that direction, and when you do the dot product, you end up uh, multiplying the parallel components together. Uh, now, we're dotting it with something that goes along the edge, so we're actually going to end up taking all of the components that are parallel. We're going to take all the parts that are parallel to the edges of our uh, our surface there, around the boundary there, and it's ultimately going to then just tell us how much is this circulating around in that manner by doing this as we shrink this down to something very small. And this we call the curl. And in fact, we're looking at what is called the, the k component of the curl, where we're taking it in the k direction, the k unit direction, the z direction. Um, and so here, uh, you can memorize this one right here, the, the partial n partial x minus partial m partial y. Or you can remember that this is curl right here. It's del cross product onto your vector function. Uh, you can see here where I'm doing the cross product there with it, and it ultimately gives you exactly what is right there. Uh, this is the two-dimensional case where z is zero, so I made z zero right here and went through and calculated, and you can see that the k component I ended up with is exactly this part right up here. So there's no reason to go through and, uh, you know, kind of memorize this up here if you can just do a cross product and remember that. Because you already know the del operator for doing the divergence and the gradient from before. So now you just add this cross product on. And if you think about it, cross products multiply parts of vectors together that are perpendicular. And so that's what this is doing, multiplying the perpendicular parts together and telling us how much it's then rotating around that point. So you would think of this more like if we put a pinwheel or um, some sort of paddle wheel at a certain point inside the vector field and whether or not it would start to make it rotate. If it would start making it rotate, then it's going to have a curl. If it won't, then it doesn't have a curl there. So uh, you can see in that first one, let's go back here, it's, that, it's the same four that we had back here, it's the same four equations. You can see if I went in here and I put like a little pinwheel in here, um, however this looks, a pinwheel like this, and it, it was free to rotate around the center right there, well what would happen is it'd be pushing on both sides by the same amount. And therefore, all right, sorry about that. Um, so as this, uh, basically, if it'll start making the pinwheel rotate, uh, then you have a curl. If it doesn't, then you're not going to have any kind of curl. So if I look here at this one, you can see that the fluid flow on both sides of the, pin, of the pinwheel are just going to cancel out. It's going to push on this side and push on this side equally. And therefore, that's not going to rotate. And so in this kind of a divergence thing here, we don't have curl going on, all right? So that's usually what you want to look for is it's going to tell you how much that pinwheel is going to rotate. If I look over here and I put like a pinwheel in, uh, you can see that the force down here is smaller than the force up here. And this would actually cause an overall rotation then to occur. And so you should have some sort of curl there with this one. And you can see it looks like it's curling around, all right? So going back over here, um, uh, here it is. No, one more. Yeah, here are the ones you can try. Uh, I did the curl for the very first one, which was that first picture we did up there that had the divergence. As you can see, everything turned out to be zero when I did the cross product there. 
and so that did, did have no curl. You should go through and try the curl on the other three and see what you end up with. First, you should go back to those pictures from before, look at them and decide if you think there is curl going on there or not, and then actually do the cross product and see whether or not you end up with zero curl or not, or uh, what you think. So uh, try and do that and build up that intuition about these things, okay? Uh, so here's, again, just another way of doing the K component of the curl. So the curl technically would be more like a, a vector or a pseudo vector, uh, but we're taking just the K component of here since we're looking at it in just the XY plane. Uh, here, find the K component for the curl. So you can go through and do just the formula they give, which is the partial N, partial X minus partial N, partial Y. Uh, but the same thing here you can do. Uh, you could also just do that as doing the uh, del cross with f and going through and getting it that way and then dotting it with k. So you can do it either way you want and get just the k component of it. Um, and I think this is one from back there. So um, anyway, uh, take a look here. Green's theorem for flux divergence. So this is a theorem that we're going to color that we're going to cover later. Um, and it's the divergence theorem, and this is just a special case of it, like the two-dimensional case. Uh, but basically the idea is we can either, right here, we can sum up all of the flux going out through the surface, right? Or we can go through and have that equal to summing up all, oops, summing up all of the flux coming into the area. So in other words, if I had something like what I have drawn here down here in this blue, if I wanted to know the amount of flux inside this blue loop that I've done, this wavy loop, I could go inside and calc up all the divergences on the inside, sum them all up, and get the total divergence inside of there. Or I could just go and calculate up or count all the flux that's going out through the surface. And those two things should be equal if I sum up all that's going in and going out. Because if you think about this, if you imagine we have a bathtub, right? So let's say we have this bathtub here. And if I want to know how much water is going into the bathtub, I can go around and I can look at the faucet and I can count the amount of water coming into the faucet and spreading out. That would be like your divergence. And I can go through and count up all the water coming in through the faucet or in through other faucets, right? Or... I could just go to the edges and see how much water is spilling over the edges after it finishes filling up. So if we pretend it's just always running and it's spilling over the edges, then every drop that comes in from the faucet has to go out over the edge because it can only hold so much. And so it's one of those two things, and then those four, therefore those two things must be equal to each other. Uh, so this is the Green Theorem two-dimensional version. This here is what we will look at in, I believe, 16.8 uh, for the divergence theorem there. It'll be a version that looks like that, uh, where we're taking the curl, uh, or I'm sorry, the divergence in the whole area or whole volume, and we're changing it to, um, well, it'll be a volume in the other one, and then we're changing it to just a line integral around the edge and looking at how much is just going through that, that flux surface. Uh, similarly here, we have a Green's theorem for curl, and basically the idea here is if we've got some sort of boundary like this around some area, I can go through and count up all of the curls inside the entire area or whatever, just do this entire area and go through and do this and get all these curls, or you know, pretend I did those little circle things, those little, those circular arrows through the whole thing. Or I can go through and realize that when I'm down here looking at this part, on this circle, it's going this way. On this circle, it's going the opposite way. And so everything in the middle is essentially going to cancel out. And the only part of the curl that we're going to need to worry about is what ends up along this outer edge, the overall total net little bit of this part on the outer edge that has nothing to cancel out with. And so what we really have to do is instead of doing the curl inside the whole volume, if it's simpler, we can just sum up all of the line integral around the outer edge. And so you can see that right here, what we've got is our line integral around 
the edges versus doing our curl over the whole area. And this would look like this in our curl notation, f dot t ds. Uh, in our curl notation, this would look like a double integral over r of del cross f, like that, da. Okay, and so we can do that instead by counting up just the perimeter stuff because all the interior stuff is essentially going to cancel out and those two then will end up being equal to each other. All right, so that's, I think, just about it. Uh, the only thing that really happens after this is just some example problems, which uh, you can look through yourselves and see. Um, here are some examples that are, that are just there in the notes. You can go look um, and work your way through them or pause them on these screens and, and take your way looking through. And there's a picture of it. Uh, then over here, again, evaluating an integral and going through and using these things uh, to go through with the Green's Theorem. And then just some examples of different boundaries and areas versus them. Okay, uh, so that's pretty much it for this section. And um, again, see sections 16, 7, and 16, 8 for more general overviews of what we were just talking about here. All right, that's it. Thanks a lot.